The State Government Finance Committee, State Government and Veterans Affairs Finance Committee will come to order. First item on the agenda today is the Minnesota Historical Society. And uh, we're going to overview and have an overview of the society, but our main uh, attention is to learn of your budget needs. Thank you very much. Director, welcome. Thank you. It's, it is a pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, may I ask if you can hear me okay? Uh, I understand that um, we have a little bit of homework to do for the chair before we launch into our presentation. I appreciate and so, that. Uh, Peggy Ingeson, our CFO, and I are providing our photographs for you, and we'll uh, provide a little introduction. I am uh, pictured on the left with a welcome sign for a great new exhibit at the Minnesota History Center that we hope you will all come to see. This is the Then Now Wow exhibit opened uh, on the early Friday morning, uh, right after Thanksgiving. We opened at 6 that morning. Uh, we had 3,000 people in the first three hours come to see this new exhibit, the biggest we've ever done, and appropriately geared to school children and families with children uh, to introduce them to all the exciting uh, components of Minnesota's history. Uh, it is, uh, was funded uh, primarily with legacy appropriation, and we are looking forward uh, to working on history in our hands devices so that as school children come to this exhibit, uh, they will uh, enhance their learning with the same handheld devices that they use to enhance every other aspect of their life. So please come to see this, and I will turn it over to Peggy to speak about hers. Ms. Angusson, welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, committee members. My name is Peggy Ingeson. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for the Minnesota Historical Society, and um, I, I, I'm just in a picture enjoying the outdoors. So I was skiing a couple days ago up in Banning State Park in the um, ruins of the sandstone quarry um, off of the Kettle River. But um, happy to be here to present our budget issues to the committee. Thank you. Our goals today are to give you a sense of uh, who we are at the Minnesota Historical Society, what we do, how we pay for this, and how we spend state and non-state funding. Uh, Madam Chair, we extend an invitation for you to bring the committee over to the History Center to see in person what we do and to have a chance to meet some of our excellent staff. And if you come after March 2nd, then you'll have the opportunity also to visit the newest exhibit at the History Center, Minnesota in the Civil War, that opens March 2nd. And then you could also take in Then Now Wow and Minnesota's Greatest Generation. First, a little bit about who we are. At our heart, we're an educational organization dedicated for many, many years to documenting and learning about our state's past. We serve learners of all ages all across the state of Minnesota. We've been doing it since we were chartered by the Territorial Legislature in 1849. Uh, we are guided by charters of 1849 and 1856. As a 501c3, we're governed by uh, an Executive Council governing board. And we carry out uh, for the state a number of duties that uh, are directed in statute, um, particularly statutory responsibilities in Chapter 138. We are constantly examining what we do, how we do it, and how we can do it better. 
in order to serve the public in the best way that we can, as efficiently as we can, with the resources that we have to work with. And to that end, um, we are working on a strategic plan. The slide says we completed it. It was actually adopted by our board last June. Um, but I think something like this is an ongoing effort, you know, in the best continuous improvement cycle of plan, do, check, act, keep on. And uh, so we continue to implement our plan through departmental work plans, strategic priority initiative teams, and continuing evaluation that informs what we do. Our mission statement reflects our aspiration to use the power of history to transform lives. And our strategic priorities focus the work that our staff does to serve the people of Minnesota. And I pause here briefly to mention two initiatives that have uh, come out of our strategic plan, planning efforts. First, evaluation. Madam Chair, I would add that our efforts to strengthen evaluation were inspired by your work and our work in the first round of legacy funding, where the expectation was that those dollars would be spent in a transparent and accountable manner. And so we worked with the Wilder Foundation, Minnesota experts on evaluation, to incorporate evaluation into the work that our staff does. Second, we strive for continuous improvement in the work that our staff performs. And we have begun to work with the Department of Administration's LEAN program to implement continuous quality improvement in our work at the Society. We have had the LEAN team in for a few training sessions. We have more scheduled, and uh, we have identified projects to work on, including greater efficiencies in the reference area and new processes in our digitization of work. Madam Chair and members of the committee, you have a lot of demands on the budget for which you are responsible. So why does history matter? And uh, we would say that it matters for in a number of ways. First, uh, in the work that we do, we are providing important educational experience for Minnesotans, young and old, all, all across the state. We perform core functions of state government in preserving and providing access to evidence of the past, supporting historic preservation, and providing citizens access to historic sites and educational opportunities. We are an, an important integral part of the tourism economy in Minnesota and as studies consistently show, cultural tourists are some of the best tourists there, they are, there are because they linger and they spend when they visit. And we are the state's stewards. Um, we are recording. Um, we are collecting things. We are preserving buildings. Um, we are fulfilling the state's responsibility to future generations um, by preserving Minnesota's legacy. We're an organization that does this through a diverse set of activities, as uh, you can see on the screen and I've been referencing. And we are organized to do this work uh, in this way. And this is very hard to read, but there is one of these organizational charts uh, in the uh, work that's been provided to the committee previously. So while we have a broad and diverse set of activities, I want to take a quick moment to mention our statewide presence through the state's historic sites network. Our motto for these sites is history where it happened. These sites add to local economies and help to tell the important stories of Minnesota's history. The next several slides give a sense of the scale of activities. And I won't read each of these items, but this will give you a sense of the large and diverse uh, the large scale and the diverse holdings that we have on behalf of the people of Minnesota. And uh, in some cases, these collections are really exceptional, even within the United States. Um, I think it's exceptional that in Minnesota, uh, because of state mandate, we get a copy of every newspaper published in the state of Minnesota. Just think what an historical record that is. And in some cases, that record is supplemented by, uh, in one case, a complete run of television news programming from the 40s to 1990. And something like that doesn't exist anywhere else in the country. 
We serve nearly a million people with in-person visits at historic sites and museums with nearly a quarter million school children. And Madam Chair, one of the activities that we're very proud of is the Northern Lights Minnesota History Curriculum, uh, now taught in the sixth grade. And uh, we're passing around the current version of Northern Lights. Uh, this is a curriculum on Minnesota for which history is a spine, but it brings in geography, economics, um, and other subjects. And we are currently working on a new print edition, which will come out in June. And uh, we will work with the State Ed Department on the teacher workshops and supplemental <coughs> curriculum material uh, for that. But we do other things, too. At the secondary level, uh, we run the state's program that is a part of the National um, History Project competition, National History Day. Nearly 30,000 secondary students across Minnesota participate in this program. It is the largest state program in the country. Uh, our kids at Nationals always do Minnesota proud, coming away with the lion's share of, of the medals. Uh, and all of the work that we do is supported by more than 24,000 members across the state and nearly 2,300 volunteers. We think that this quote from El Elmer Anderson, who was a great friend of the society, sums up the importance of the work that we do with your important support. Uh, Governor Anderson said, there is no question that the values that built the past are essential to our future, but we cannot assume that they will be automatically adopted by future generations. The Minnesota Historical Society is a vital factor in preserving the best of the past and projecting it into the future. This slide will give you a sense of our overall budget picture. Overall, as you can see in the, um, the, bottom, the bottom slice, state funding comprises about two-thirds of our budget, with state general fund dollars making up the largest single share. The state has been, uh, state funding has been important over the years. Most recently, the state provides about $20.4 million annually for the society's programs and operations. This funding is uh, a, an important foundation for all that we do. We leverage it to raise additional funding to provide a high quality statewide history program. Our donors tell us that they are willing to help out in partnership with the state to do the broad work of the Minnesota Historical Society. Our work is people intensive. It takes staff to greet and to teach. It takes staff uh, to do the work at the History Center in our historic sites and to do the important collecting work and connect that and make it accessible to the public. Sixty percent of our state general fund budget is spent on compensation and uh, a, a great deal of the balance, uh, about half of the balance, is spent on fixed costs of operating facilities for utilities, maintenance, etc. Here is another way of looking at how our funding uh, is expended by program area. And you can see that the History Center, which is the green slice, and the Historic Sites, which is the blue slice, comprise about half of the overall budget. Here we look at um, our fund state funding picture over the last 10 years. Uh, and you can see that we have experienced over the last 10 years a reduction of about $7 million, or 25% of the, uh, the funding level from a decade ago. Uh, and we have worked hard throughout this period to maintain a quality history program accessible to the public. But, you know, of course, it's been a challenge to do that uh, with this significant, significantly lower funding level. For this session, the governor has recommended level funding, or approximately $20.4 million annually, for society activities. That does not include the pass-through appropriations. Should additional funding be available, we would be able to increase access to the state facilities in which the state has made such significant investments. So this would include uh, longer seasons and more hours at historic sites and the History Center Library increased access to and care for collections, improved field services, 
uh, and our ability to strengthen our out, out statewide outreach to local history and heritage organizations. The second initiative that you see here is a proposal to improve educational achie achievement by enhancing teacher training and development of curriculum material to accompany the Northern Lights curriculum and by increasing our hands-on programming for youth. The next two slides provide a look at the budget structure as outlined in your budget books. The first slide breaks down the society's budget by budget program, which is what you'll ultimately see in appropriation language. A few things to note here. The main program for MHS is called Programs and Operations. Uh, the Historic Preservation Tax Credit Grant in lieu of credit, that's program program passed by the legislature in 2010, uh, statutory appropriation, sometimes called open and standing appropriation. That appears on the tracking sheet, but it's not in the appropriations bill. And we serve as fiscal agent for uh, some pass through. The next slide breaks down the overall budget by funding source with the general fund, sometimes called the direct appropriation and um, the Historic Preservation and Tax Credit and Grant in lieu of tax credit noted on the next line. So, so he says panting, that's a quick look at the, uh, the work of the Minnesota Historical Society and uh, the funding, uh, the very important funding that the state provides for this work uh, and that, that we then leverage to, to find additional funding. I think in summary, I would, I would just say it's, it's vital to recognize uh, the singular work we do in documenting and collecting and preserving and education, providing important statewide uh, educational opportunities, both at sixth grade and the secondary levels, but for lifelong learners all over, uh, which is being constantly strengthened and improved uh, through technology and digital access to what we do. That we use that statewide funding to provide a strong foundation um, for the work that this leading state history organization in this country does. And lastly, that uh, we take very seriously and work very hard at serving the people of Minnesota at, at providing good access to uh, these resources and these facilities. And we look forward uh, to, um, uh, to looking at ways that we can continue to increase that, ex uh, that access and strengthen our service. Thank you. Pretty good, Director <laughs> Elliott, in your time frame. Um, Representative Simon. Thank you for your testimony and thanks for all that you do. Um, just a money question. I'm looking at on page 8 at the bottom slide right below the Elmer Anderson slide. Page 8 of our handout, I realize that's different. I just want to get a sense. It says 19% of your budget is non-state, and then it says parentheses earned and contributed. I guess I missed the distinction there, and I'm wondering uh, what is the distinction between earned and contributed, and then also what portion of that is what I guess I would call donations, and that's what right. you mean by contributed, just right. donations from members or others in the community, charitable donations. Uh, earned income is uh, income that comes in through things like admissions, program fees, product purchases, and then contributed income would be memberships, annual gifts, and um, that's the distinction between earned and contributed. And did I, did I miss one of your questions? Madam Chair, yes. Uh, I guess I was wondering, just in terms of that latter category, just people contributing, not right. people who visit, but just people who, as part of their charitable donations, what's the ballpark? I have to figure about what that might be per year. Ms. Angusson. Um, Madam Chair, Representative, uh, it's about $2 million a year in contributions um, separate from the uh, <coughs> admission fees, and then there's a membership um, about $400,000 a year. <coughs> Representative Simon. And one other quick one is I remember hearing a few years ago, but I forgot the details about what the uh, Historical Society does in terms of the legislature. I know there's some archiving or, or, or record keeping as to the legislature. In fact, I remember being told when I first came in, I remember my first day of orientation when I did the, uh, <laughs> uh, as, as we all did, the, the video interview uh, here. 
uh, we were told that someday that would end up at the Historical Society and that, you know, generations from now people would see that interview. Are there other ways in which what we do here ends up uh, oh, yeah. being archived? One of the functions that we perform for the state is we, we are the state archives. And so essential records, um, including legislative records, but also um, many other records uh, such as birth and death records and um, state agency records, essential state records that need to be permanently preserved are those, that's the work that we perform um, in terms of collecting preserving, providing access. Representative Benson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, once just a, a comment. I, I'm a history buff. I love the opportunity to bring the, the grade school kids, the fifth and sixth graders that come from my, my district up to the Capitol. I wish more of them did. I guess they have an option of either going skating or bowling to the Capitol. And <laughs> for me, at least, it's a no-brainer. Come to the Capitol. Uh, just a little comment. It would be great. I mean, I'd pay out for it out of campaign funds if you all had come up with some little trinkets I could buy reasonably well. So when I buy two, three hundred at a time, that would be a, a rem remembrance of their visit to the Capitol, kind of a takeaway. We would be delighted to do that. That's cool. a great idea. All right. Um, uh, but my question is uh, on the top of page 10, the slide. Um, and I don't, I, I'm sure you don't mean it this way, but it's somewhat deceptive in terms of some of the, maybe the newer members, but maybe you can help clarify it. Uh, the impact of the legacy fund in terms of, it would appear that suddenly we've gotten to be super, super stingy and, and, uh, but I also know that there's some legacy funds that kind of flow in. Sure. Can you kind of help uh, the rest of us kind of understand that slide? Uh, absolutely. And of course, we don't view you as being stingy. There have been uh, some economic vicissitudes that have occurred in that period and you know and everybody has dealt with those um, the uh, the legacy funding that came about uh, through a vote of the citizens of Minnesota late in 2008 uh, there, there are significant legacy funds that um, do come to and flow through the organization but that funding cannot be used to uh, substitute for to supplant ongoing programs and operations. So ongoing programs and operations that have been impacted by this uh, decline in state funding um, have not been able to be supported by legacy funding. The legacy funding, um, there is some legacy funding that goes to support specific um, projects that weren't otherwise being done. And then much of that legacy funding, we operate as a grant, uh, a re-grant program that goes out all across the state, every county in this state, uh, in, every, in every county, there have been history and heritage organizations that have received legacy grant funds. Call it, Madam Chair. Represent Benson. <clears throat> um, but when I look at this slide, um, I, I guess I'm, uh, there would probably have been before the legacy amendment and funds available for those one time. So we're going to do the cool Civil War thing that's coming up. I don't know if that would be, uh, that would be, there would be money from the legacy fund possible for that. But prior to the legacy fund, um, you would have had to take in monies out of your general fund budget in order to support the things that are even one time. So, you know, when I, when I look at this slide, it looks like you're just automatically not spending that, much, that level. And, and I understand where you're coming from and understanding how we have to use legacy funds. But um, for a matter of budget purposes and planning and so on, um, you are getting a significant amounts of money from the <coughs> legacy to help support many of the things that you do or would do. Well, many of those things would have been, uh, would not be being done without the legacy right. money right now. Right. I mean, that, that legacy funding really is just extraordinary that the citizens did that. And w what it makes possible, particularly given what's happened in the last five years, probably wouldn't be being done otherwise. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Swatsky. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, Director. Um, this is more of a comment. I am a sixth grade, I teach in a sixth, seventh and eighth grade school building. And uh, the Minnesota History Project, when it comes around, we all take a deep breath because we know we're going to get wonderful results, but it's a huge uh, uh, project that our students um, participate in. And so I really find that it's a great project and it's a wonderful experience for the kids. And um, it's, it's always fun to see what they come up with and it builds really great skills. So I really appreciate that. And I do, uh, Madam Chair, I, I also uh, would echo what 
Representative Benson um, had requested that some kind of a trinket would be neat because I w I've been trying to think of that myself as a new legislator. It's uh, something that um, I would like to, if not, just go back to my own buildings with, not even if they come and visit me, but um, I think kids deserve some kind of, and maybe you have it. That's a great idea. We'll come up with some ideas and, and use you guys sounding boards. Great. And then Northern Lights, um, I'm happy to hear that you're um, talking about Northern Lights because I do work out of that text. And um, I, you probably have no control over this. I don't know. But it would be nice if it were available, um, like for iPad users and that kind of thing. So may, in, may I respond to that? Director Elliott. Oh, okay. Uh, oh. Yes, uh, we, are, we are at that seam in communications and uh, where... Who knows how many more printed textbooks there will be. So in our co many conversations with educators in planning the new edition, uh, we have planned this next edition to be a print edition that is enriched with many online and supplemental resources, understanding that this edition will probably bridge to a, the, the one beyond this is probably not going to be a print textbook, but will, is that, Spotsky. And just as a follow-up, I am a special education teacher, and I teach students with learning disabilities, and so it's always nice that the less that we have to make some adaptations and modifications to the print, um, it helps a lot. So I know that that's all in the writer's hands, but that's great. Thank you. Some of the pieces now are online as apps from the new edition. <laughs> Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Represent Hall. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and educate me out of ignorance, uh, and you probably know this, uh, Representative Swatsky, but is this, is this available to all schools at the sixth grade level, or is this uh, is something they have to purchase? <coughs> the, the, each school district makes a decision about purchasing the material. Um, so in the new standards, it's mandated that Minnesota will be taught in the sixth grade as opposed to somewhere in a band of grades, and then uh, it's up to each school district to decide what material will be purchased that supports that. And um, right now, um, about half of the uh, sixth grade students in the state use this curriculum for that. Um, in the the slide on the, that your repository for various things in 1,100 or some number of films. Are they Minnesota films, or are they just films that were donated, or well, they would what have to films have are we talking connection. about, or did you produce them? No, let me, the, um, I'm going to take a swing at this, and then if, uh, if our deputy director, for, for example, yesterday when we took a Senate committee into the library, uh, Curator Coleman was talking about some of the things we have collected that have to do with Minnesota authors. And so we have, you know, editions of Sinclair Lewis's work or F. Scott Fitzgerald's and copies of the films then that pertain to those, those books. So there's, a, there's always a Minnesota, or they could be films that were, you know, on a Minnesota topic and made that anything that you would want to add to that? So we could just come to the History Society and say we want to see the old show from... 1932, and you'd pull out a selection, and we'd look. <laughs> May I ask Deputy Director for Program Garter <laughs> to field that? On our night out, <laughs> that we're going to come and visit you behind the scenes. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Patricia Garter, Pat Garter. I'm the Deputy Director for Programs at the Minnesota Historical Society. I wish it were that simple. There are a lot of technology issues, so I would suspect that a film from 1932 we'd have to look carefully at how we could present it to you. But to answer your primary question, we look carefully at acquisitions, and we have an acquisition committee that looks for Minnesota connection. But as the director mentioned, we would collect items like a film that was based on Sinclair Lewis's books because of the way they represent and tie back to Minnesota history. But we don't collect non-related material whenever possible. Thank you very much. And then if you could address um, your outreach program with local 
history buffs or history societies. Um, I know the pretty newly formed Hermantown Historical Society. Um, it's not yet a part of the St. Louis County Historical Society, but they're talking. Um, they've received help, they've received uh, assistance, and they've received a grant. Um, how many of these do you give out each year, and, and how do they just call up and say we need help? Well, Madam Chair, members of the committee, again, um, there's some subtlety to the answer. We make, do you have a sense, David, of the number of legacy small grants? The legacy grant program, we give out hundreds of grants around the state. But the, there's other, there, you have a grant program. We have a small, we have a relatively small grant program and we give out um, much under 100 grants that are part of that program. But we are working closely with members of local historical organizations wherever and whenever we can across the state through direct consultation, direct support, workshops, seminars. Um, it's an area that we'd like to expand. We know that as we um, retracted over the last 10 years that there were some reductions in service there and we're looking carefully at how we can rebuild that now. Thank you very much. I just want, I brought this up because I wanted it known that one of the reasons that you are the pass-through agency for the legacy grants because you had a proven record of a successful, experienced, efficient record of making competitive grants through your previous existence before the legacy money came in. And so you were chosen as the pass-through uh, agency because you had already proven yourself. And so those two things are separate, but yet it was your framework that was already in existence that said. That's very true. You Thank you, Madam this. Chair. And that's a great strength, but it's also a service that has to be recognized, too. Representative Detmer. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, uh, and uh, Director, I was just looking at our reports here on uh, performance measures, and uh, we see a, a real increase in the History Center museum visitations. Uh, and that's, that's great. Um, also, website visitations, we've seen an increase. And uh, the library, the library is, is bought stable. There's one area that the historical sites visitations, there's been a decrease uh, in that. Can you just explain what contributes to that, or is it just a common thing? Well, we're looking from 2011 to 2012. Well, one of Director the, uh, Elliott. One of the ways that we have dealt with reduced funding is uh, by contr uh, we've had to con contract the, um, the availability of uh, sites hours. So, um, regrettably, uh, I think, and sadly, the seasons have shortened for historic sites. Hours have contracted. Uh, and the same has been true with the library. I think if you look at the schedule of library hours now compared to some years ago, uh, the library is probably available about 20% fewer hours. It's not open on Sundays right now. Um, the historic site hours over the years have contracted by 23%, yeah. something like that. Um, you know, it's one way of dealing with the uh, reduced funding and something that we would absolutely love to be able to open back up. Representative Newton. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Director Elliott, um, when we look at the uh, chart on um, the funding, it, it would appear, correct me if I'm wrong, but about five million in your funding comes from the general fund, and seven or eight million comes from the legacy. Is that is that about right? 
20.4 comes from the general fund. How, how much? 20.4 million. 20.4 million. Okay. So, so the figure on uh, page 10 uh, that shows the, the decrease in funding from 25 million down to 20 is is all general fund money. Yes. It doesn't include any legacy money. Okay. Thank you. Correct. Representative Freiberg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I know um, this is just to kind of follow up on the chair's uh, previous question. I know the the legacy funds aren't supposed to supplant existing funds, but you mentioned that some of the some of the grants that you give out, you have uh, a couple hundred through the legacy amendment, but then but that you also have maybe a hundred or so that are still there. I'm just wondering what the what the distinction is because I know the uh, the Golden Valley Historical Society, which I used to serve on the board of uh, had received a grant and I'm pretty sure it was a legacy grant to fix up the basement of their of the building which is a historic church there thank you for that by the way <laughs> um, but anyway I'm just wondering if there's another source I can suggest to them and w what the non legacy grants are used for primarily well, it's, it's a good question I'm going to ask Peggy or Pat to Madam Chair, I'm David Kelleher from the Minnesota Historical Society. Um, referencing back to your question and, and the, the current question, um, we've been administering grants since 1969, so Madam Chair, you're correct. We have a long track record in administering grant programs. The primary grant program that we administer is um, through the legacy funds, through the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. We administer some grant programs through the capital budget, bonding. Those are available for building projects, for publicly owned buildings. Um, so if, if you have a, a city-owned building that's a historic building, they can access that. In some cases, there are some federal funds available for what are called certified local governments. Those are local units of government that have um, historic preservation commissions. Um, there's a small amount available through those. If your uh, constituents have questions, um, they can certainly give us a call and we can put them in touch with the uh, uh, field services staff through the State Historic Preservation Office. Um, and that office does the field services where they provide advice and guidance and administer the grant program. So we'd be happy to point them in the right direction. Thank you very much. We appreciate your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Second item on the agenda is the overview and review of governor's recommendations for the Office of Enterprise Technology or MINUTE. Welcome to the committee and commissioner. <coughs> I have Thank to, you, Madam Chair. I have to tell you that at our last meeting, the Assistant Commissioner O'Brien at Budget Management showed pictures of her dog, which is big competition to Sage. Well, they are the same breed, Madam Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all beautiful. Yes, they are. Welcome. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee. Um, uh, I am not going to give you an entire overview of um, OET, now known as Minute Services. Um, it, we have so much going on, it would really take quite a long time. But I do want to sort of orient you to what we've been going through so that you have some context for where we are at this point. So if you recall in uh, 2011, um, the legislators, the legislation um, was um, passed that um, called for consolidation of all of IT in the executive branch. Um, we were given actually 10 weeks to make sure that we had our first pass at all IT assets, all IT people, all IT projects um, in our portfolio. Um, we were not um, allocated any dollars to do this, so we've actually been doing um, the vast majority of it in-house. In um, we did not have to um, designate specific dollar savings or specific efficiencies. We were just charged with consolidation and finding those efficiencies and making sure that we did not have a lot of replicated systems and services in the state. 
We were also required to um, manage all of IT through comprehensive service level agreements that we needed to have in place by June 30th of 2012. And we were asked to establish a technology advisory committee um, to advise us not necessarily on IT consolidation but on the delivery of IT services going forward. So um, we were able to do all of those things and um, uh, met every uh, deadline that we were um, given. Um, we now have a new name. One of the things we're focusing on in terms of delivering IT in a new way is actually uh, considering it an opportunity to build a new IT um, agency and culture in the state of Minnesota. Part of doing that was to um, charge, uh, change our name. So we think that Minute Services, which really stands for Minnesota IT, is very unique to the state and uh, gives us that uh, new identity that we uh, are looking for. We now um, have approximately 2,055 employees delivering IT. Uh, we are in 22 agency-based offices, some offices serving more than one agency, 90 physical locations statewide. We have learned that there are more than 2,000 distinct applications. And um, just to give you a, a factoid around that, um, I have been told that more than 500 of those applications are mission critical enough that if they are down for any period of time, there is a threat to either public safety or the public welfare or the public good. So that's uh, quite sobering. Uh, we now have um, an operating budget of about $451 uh, million dollars per year. And uh, because we were actually taking 70 different boards and agencies and combining them under one roof, we were really talking about 70 different ways of <coughs> delivering IT services to the state. We all didn't even use the same language to describe those IT services. So for example, one IT um, a department might call a service desk a service desk. Another might call it a help desk. So one of the first things we did was to develop an IT reference model that defines um, IT consistently in terms of um, a, a set of functions that we expect every agency needs. So for example, one of the functions is security. So as a result of having a reference model that defines security in the same way for all agencies, um, we were able to build that into our service level agreement and into our inventory. So we now know um, exactly who is delivering um, security services, where, how much it costs, and if there are agencies that do not have that function in place. So um, one of the benefits of IT consolidation is that if an agency does not have a security function in place, we can now sort of jump over those boundaries of agencies and share that resource amongst agencies. It's a real advantage, I think, of IT consolidation. So just to give a little sense um, of what we do, we really are um, uh, responsible for the delivery of all IT in the executive branch. We have um, a, a statewide network, and by that I don't mean that we have the fiber and we have the connectivity, but we have all the contracts with telcos throughout the state that provides connectivity for all of our state agencies and for um, example um, for counties as well, for Minsk as well, all 50 plus of their campuses um, are connected via our network. We support um, the uh, SWIFT system, the new budget system, um, the tax collection system, <coughs> the um, unemployment insurance insist, uh, system. Um, we support the applications that allow our citizens to transact business with the state online instead of in line. Um, and I'm a big uh, proponent of that. I think that the state has not been uh, aggressive enough in getting more of its services online. I'll talk about that a little bit later. But just an example, um, you know, if you are a camper, uh, DNR has an online reservation system that you can reserve uh, months in advance uh, for camping sites or cabins or whatever. That's the kind of service that we think uh, we need more of uh, and that um, citizens will benefit from. And then of course we run the facilities that store and secure the state's 
um, data. We are stewards of the data. We don't own it. We don't um, define rules around it, but we know where it is. And based on requests from agencies, we do uh, provide access to that data. So our uh, budget is um, uh, for the next biennium, uh, $902 million. You can see it's broken down into different categories. We're sort of changing um, as a result of IT consolidation the old OET way of uh, calculating and charging for services. We are largely a chargeback organization. The service level agreements that I spoke to sooner uh, or earlier um, actually are a baseline for what IT um, uh, was existing in agencies. We assigned a cost to it and any variation from that baseline service level agreement um, is a variation in the budget uh, for IT for that agency. And just to give you a little perspective, uh, one of the things we've been pretty intent on is benchmarking ourselves with other entities, with the private sector, with the public sector. Uh, $902 million sounds like an awful lot of money, and it is an awful lot of money, but just to give some sense, we went out and looked at um, some Gartner data, some CIO magazine data, executive board data related to all industries, uh, nonprofit, public sector. These are large um, uh, information technology entities that are, uh, in, in general, very well respected and, and global in nature. And you can see that we are not uh, spendthrifts by uh, any stretch of the imagination when you look at uh, benchmarking against some of these other um, categories. We also have a project portfolio. One of the things that is new under IT consolidation is a statewide uh, project portfolio. You can see that we uh, basically inherited for fiscal year 13 uh, $212 million worth of projects. Two of those um, are uh, very large projects are the health exchange and MinLARS, which is the replacement of the uh, Minnesota uh, licensing and registration system. We do have um, in the governor's budget uh, requests for 92.5 um, uh, million in new project dollar requests. Um, and and uh, we do have a, a list of what those are. These requests are going to be represented um, in the committees that the business um, presents their budget to but we will also be presenting you with the summary of all of those IT projects. So change items. Um, we were asked to take a 5% uh, cut in our budget. Um, so when we look at the past funding of um, OET before it was MINUT, we largely were funded through chargebacks. Um, for the services that we provided. However, there was a general allocation from the general fund um, to cover both the costs of the CIO office, and that entailed um, being able to see that some statutory requirements around project management and risk assessment were accomplished. But it was also designed to get an information security program uh, up and running. So when we were asked to take a 5% cut in that particular general fund, um, we uh, took that cut um, to the IT security uh, and leadership fund. Um, and we're comfortable that we can continue to provide security that's needed, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, excuse me for interrupting, but yes, just for my clarification, when were you asked to take that 5% cut? Um, we were asked um, to take a five to, to find a five percent cut in the in the governor's budget uh, for this uh, next biennium. Thank you. When you made your proposal to the governor's right. people, they said five percent cut. We were asked to find a five percent reduction in our in our costs for the general fund. Yes. All right. And so, out of that then came the security reduction. Right. Thank you. 
Um, secondly, um, because we now have um, a larger IT budget, um, we also looked at 5% uh, a cut in that larger general fund that um, actually sort of flows through agencies or for fiscal year 13 has flowed through agencies. And again, we are taking a look at um, that and we are, are um, we're pretty confident that that will not uh, cause us any hardship. It certainly does not signal any reduced commitment to improving security. But one of the things that we have recognized that we need to do with IT consolidation is to take security out of a program only approach and operationalize it. So prior to consolidation, we had a pretty sound and actually nationally recognized security program. And we could go to um, uh, agencies and say, don't you think this is a great idea? We think you should have a chief information security officer in your agency and we think that you should have um, you know, uh, a threat assessment done every X amount of time. Well, now we're responsible for that. So now we have to take that security program and operationalize it. And we are able to do that. We're able to leverage the security um, resources uh, around the state uh, agencies and be able to uh, come up with an adequate approach to security um, in light of uh, spending cuts. So we will continue um, our very serious approach to um, security uh, and again, uh, given the size of our budget and given the fact that we are very, um, uh, very much on the path of finding efficiencies that will lead to cost savings, we are not concerned about this cut at this point. Um, when we uh, look at overall requests that um, relate to the budget, um, you know, I spoke earlier of the DNR uh, camp reservation system. The interesting thing about that system is that um, there is a convenience fee sort of tacked on to that system that convenience fee is collected by the vendor that provides that particular website and service. And it um, is provided, uh, the, the actual website and support of it is provided at no charge to DNR. So here you see a picture of Sage again, um, because I am such a proponent of, uh, of online e-services, so I have a little story about that. When I rescued Sage, oh, it must have been about five years ago, uh, my only option for getting a dog license was to write a check and put it in the mail or to go to City Hall. Um, and then one day in the, I was reading in the Star and Tribune that there was now going to be a $200 fine if you didn't have your dog license. And I thought, wow, that's pretty hefty. But when I read the article, they said, well, that's because we now have given you the capability of getting your dog license online. So no more excuses about not having stamps or not having time to go down to the city hall. Um, and you know, there's a convenience fee um, uh, tied into that particular service that I am more than happy to pay because it really is a convenience for me to, to get my dog license from the city of Minneapolis just by going online. I can do it all from my couch. So um, given the fact that we are now responsible for all of IT, for all agencies, in this new world, we would have had that authority to work with an agency or with a vendor that DNR now does in order to provide this kind of public-private partnership to provide this kind <coughs> of e-services um, uh, for citizens. So we are asking for that same authority that a number of agencies do have. We've sort of grown up as an agency now, um, and we are, um, we are interested in uh, establishing a, a public-private partnership um, that will allow us to exponentially, um, I believe, increase our e-services to, to citizens. There is a model across the country in, in use right now by about uh, 28 states that allows for this. Um, and has, has turned out to be um, very, very effective um, for uh, a number of applications and services that um, we, quite frankly, are quite behind in. This will be measured by um, a rating that the Center for Digital Government gives to all states. Now, we are pretty proud because we were bumped up from a B, I think, to an A- minus in the last measurement, but I'm just competitive enough that I want an A. 
Um, and uh, there are only two other states, um, Utah and Michigan, that have A's. So um, we're on the path to try to get to an A. If you want to kind of see the, um, the variety of applications provided through a public-private partnership, go and look at utah.gov or I believe it's also michigan.gov and, and you can sort of see the, um, the functionality that they have built um, into those applications. Questions? So, Commissioner, on the, the point of the vendors and that you can now buy your dog license online and you can make a, we can make a reservation at our campgrounds in the state park um, through DNR, that means that those jobs then are Minnesota jobs and that service is being provided to Minnesotans from Minnesota. Madam Chair, yes, that that uh, is the case. The, the particular uh, public-private partnership that we would be interested in actually brings a presence to Minnesota, works very closely with agencies um, in order to really define what it is that agencies can benefit from. Um, it's, not, it's not an outsourced um, uh, option per se. Um, so that's a good, a good thing. I think it's a good thing. And could could a city that was requiring their citizens to pay parking tickets to send their checks off to New York to pay their parking tickets, could we provide that service to a city so that they could send their parking tickets to Minnesota through this online service? Um, Madam Chair, in the IT world and the online service, you could do practically anything. Um, we do not have anything um, well defined enough that, you know, we would take that as a, a, a first option. But there are all kinds of possibilities. We would initially focus just on state agency services to citizens, though, in my opinion. we might direct somebody from that city to see how you did it, made the transition for DNR to become a Minnesota-based vendor for those services. And they that might be able to establish the line for their citizens all by themselves. The city could. Madam Chair, that would, might be a possibility, yes. Thank you. Representative Benson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you know, over the last couple of years, I have gained an enormous respect for the work that you guys do. Um, uh, I really appreciate you and uh, and all that you do. And I I know that we've uh, with with some legislation to the back office consolidation and all the things that you do. You guys have had a yeoman's job uh, to get done. So, first, my hats off. Thank you. A, a couple of, of questions. Now that that you now service so many. You know, clients, you, you're a profit center and a cost center a little bit, but a profit center in terms of, of the, the work that you do. Um, I noticed that on here that you're going to be delving into the DVS phone system, and thank you, um, and thank you, thank you. But can you, can you address at all, I mean, what we have seen in DVS in terms of their software and systems update and all that, they have been going through this process. It seems like it's over budget and... Um, can you can you shed any light on you've not had a lot of work in that I'm I may be mistaken but I don't think you have can we see forward that because of your expertise you're going to be much more involved in those big expensive systems so that we have people that and in, in, uh, you don't have to apologize for DVS on this I just kind of get a, a sense of of where you at and how you would be helping other agencies Commissioner Parnell uh, Madam Chair, Representative Benson, um, yes, I have, um, let's say, inserted myself into many of these large projects. Um, uh, I think there um, are ways that we can achieve um, better ends through some of these projects. And, and on the bigger ones, I have made sure that we really have some of our best people. Uh, the health exchange is another example, um, as well as the DVS system. Uh, yeah, we're very much uh, tracking them and um, very conscious of uh, the need to, to move a little faster, um, move at the speed of business, and achieve things 
um, that the business really requires. Great. Thank you. Follow up, Matt. Um, Representative Benson, DVS is Department of Vehicles. Um, driver and Vehicle Services. Okay. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Perna Oh, please. Representative Benson. Um, can you? Uh, and I know we had a couple. We had a number of data analytic bills in the last couple of years, and and there is a master's data analytic contract. How does the, the on your list with uh, the slide there the DNR data analytics? Can you did you just describe that a little bit, or that's something completely different on this slide? Commissioner, uh, Madam Chair, Representative Benson, um, I believe that the the DNR analytics is a little bit um, different. They're using a lot of customer data that they want to use to enhance services. Some of the data analytics contracts that were put in place by the Department of Administration are in use. Um, I'm not responsible for those contracts, and I think they're um, going after a little more in the realm of cost savings or fraud detection or whatever. My understanding is that the DNR is, is more related to in, enhancing their um, uh, interaction with uh, citizens. Thank you. Just a question for you, Madam Chair. Representative, you you brought up in, in some questioning about um, the uh, re the reason they took the five percent cut and and um, I was just wondering from a, a procedural standpoint at some point we'll get to this but how soon will we uh, as a committee begin to see the amounts of money that you've been given as a committee chair to work with in terms of budgets? I bet it'll be over. Four weeks from now. Four weeks. Okay. Thank you. But between four and eight weeks. Thank you. I think it's in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> Postal Service is a representative. <laughs> Representative Freiberg. Sure. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just interested in the... Um, current involvement of Minute uh, with local units of government um, and also the capacity to expand. I noticed on your slide uh, that's just entitled Our Role, it says you connect agency, you connect counties and school districts uh, to the internet. Um, you mentioned the dog license example, which is of course a local issue. Um, you know, I was on the city council in nine years and we'd purchase many of our technology uh, items through Logis, which is a consortium of cities that works on that issue, on those issues, and periodically we discuss, uh, do we really want to be giving them this much money? Um, so I'm, I'm just sort of curious exactly what your involvement with local units of government is and if, you, if there's capacity to expand that role. I imagine with a 5% cut that too much expansion would be difficult, but just curious. Commissioner Parnell. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Representative, um, we are always looking for opportunities to partner with local government, with higher education, and uh, anyone who's interested. We believe that just the sheer volume um, of services uh, will drive down the costs. Um, and we do already provide um, services to school districts and to counties. We provide um, uh, email solution to the city of St. Paul. I meet regularly once a month with the higher ed CIOs just looking for these kinds of potentials and possibilities uh, to partner in, in any number of uh, IT projects. I meet with the CIOs from um, Hennepin County, Ramsey County, City of St. Paul and City of Minneapolis, again looking for those kinds of opportunities to partner. Um, and we um, are, are very much um, in tune with uh, with uh, being able to offer our services to as many people uh, as are interested. Representative Nelson. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioner. Um, I got two questions. One goes back to when uh, Representative Murphy, the Chair Murphy's uh, question about when you were asked to take the 5% cut. I mean, you said it's part of the governor's building his budget, but when, when was that month, you know, when what? What time of the year was that, or what, when was that? Uh, Commissioner Parnell. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Nelson, um, I think it was um, at, at the end of the calendar year. I couldn't be sure. Um, I don't know if you recall. Um, 
uh, you know, it was asked of all agencies. So we were not in any way, shape, or form singled out. Um, we were just asked to find efficiencies that would uh, achieve a 5% uh, reduction in our, in our and, budget. Thank you. And Madam Chair? And the other question I have has the, your pie chart here of the of the leader of the uh, your biennial budget. Going back to that, you have the one this 17 percent is for leadership. Is that the administrative cost? Is that or what is that? Um, if you look at our statute 16E, um, we are required to have a fair amount of oversight in um, uh, all things IT. Um, so that is uh, related to having a, a state level project management office. Um, we have to put in um, standards and methodologies that are consistent across the state. It also relates to um, just kind of general leadership and procurement. We have already found um, some pretty um, significant savings in procurement by virtue of IT consolidation. So I don't, I, I guess you could maybe call it uh, administrative, but I think it's far more functional than that and uh, very, very specific um, to IT and delivering IT. And I might add, um, because we're doing the IT consolidation work in-house, we have a lot of people uh, working on it. Doesn't, it doesn't appear to that be far out of line. Thank you. Representative Howe. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner, uh, in the uh, legislative auditor in the SWIFT re report uh, indicated that the Department of Management and Budget didn't implement the internal systems or controls to prevent and detect the unauthorized access to databases. Uh, what involvement do you have in setting those internal controls in those other departments now that you've taken the reins of all this massive <laughs> Uh, uh, this massive undertaking. Commissioner. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Howe, um, agencies are responsible determining who has access to data and what the uh, level of security needs to be. We are responsible for seeing that those security standards are met. So they determine, for example, who in the financial world has what access to what part of SWIFT and then we comply with those requests. Follow up. Representative Howe. Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, as far as implementing goes, they, uh, the reason it hasn't been done is they haven't identified uh, who needs access or is it that they, I guess I, my question is, is the implementation, is it because the, that your agency hasn't implemented or is it because they haven't identified who needs access? Um, Representative Howe, uh, you know, I, I quite honestly can't recall the details of that audit report, um, although I did read it and we were, uh, we did have people at the table. Um, I, w I would have to review that um, separately. Representative Howe. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, and, and getting off of it, I guess what I'm actually looking for is what my concern is is now we're going to have this huge health exchange database, and when we look at when I look at back at the, that problem that we had with that agency, I'm looking at a database that's as you quite understand is massive, bigger than whatever we've had anywhere else, and with a cut in your budget, my concern is how is that going to affect your ability to 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 secure that database and those accesses with that large and, and, and taking a reduction. Are you, are you going to need additional staff? How's, I guess, the implementation of that? Have you looked at that and what's that going to take? Commissioner Parnell. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Howe, um, the reason I'm comfortable with taking a cut in this area is that we are sort of revamping the entire approach to IT in the state. And, uh, for example, um, you know, we spent a good deal of the first year lining things up so that when it came time to execute um, for the efficiencies that we were looking for, we were prepared to do that. So we have now launched into what we're calling a tactical plan, which is where we really find those efficiencies that lead to cost savings 
that will balance out the cuts in security and the and the, the savings in IT services that um, uh, will will balance each other out going forward. It's really difficult for us to say at this point. Well, you know, we're going to take this six million dollar cut in security or um, uh, some other area, but we know that we're going to save 13 million somewhere. But we're relatively assured that once we get through this tactical plan, we can look backward and really calculate what those cost savings are. Now, we have already, already, as I mentioned, um, achieved some significant procurement savings. When we look at uh, taking 20 different contracts from the same vendor, uh, the way they were distributed around the executive branch, and sort of roll them into one and negotiate with the vendor uh, on cost savings, we've already saved millions of dollars. And we think that once we um, are really um, going, um, ma making progress in our tactical plan, we will have those operational efficiencies that will also translate to savings. Again, as I mentioned, um, we are able now to cross agency borders and look at security resources uh, across um, all agencies. So when it comes to the health exchange, we um, again have our best people uh, working on that. Um, we are uh, taking security very seriously and um, operationalizing so that it's baked into everything. It's very much on our minds. Um, so we think that um, you know, in the next two years, um, th that kind of expectation uh, of a cut will, will balance it itself out quite well. Excellent. Representative Powell. Very good. Representative Nelson. Thank you, Madam Chair. So tagging off of what Representative Howe asked, because we're securing all this in a larger database, isn't it more efficient to do to secure that in a larger database than in multiple databases scattered all over the state, and it would would that would that lead to efficiencies and and cut the cost of, of providing that um, security in the, for the database? Commissioner Parnell, uh, Madam Chair, um, uh, Representative Nelson, um, I it sounds to me like you're talking about data centers, and um, the fact is that right now we have. Uh, multiple data centers all around this, the, the state um, that we are consolidating into one um, uh, more adequate uh, site for these kinds of systems. We have um, now secured a lease on a tier three data center that will provide both the security and the redundancy that we need. In my mind, this is a remedial um, step. It should have been done five or six years ago. Uh, we will start moving systems uh, into this new space um, starting in uh, March, I believe. So we are uh, stepping up um, that security as well. Representative Khan. Yes. Um, uh, Madam Chairman and Commissioner, one of the things that I've been uh, realizing recently talking to people like county commissioners and so forth, is some of the real problems that we're having in local IT systems, like possibly at the county. I, I don't know if it applies to all counties or all cities or so forth, but particularly I think as we get with the health exchange system, the state has to do a lot of interaction with these. Is, um, oh, uh, uh, are we going to get involved with this somehow? Or are you, I should say? Or, you know, is, is that something, is the connection of the state to local units of government something that needs to be looked at? Commissioner? Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Khan, um, I believe that we um, offer services to counties, especially in the DHS world, and um, they're going to be, um, I think, beneficiaries in particular of the DHS modernization plan that is part of the uh, uh, governor's budget. Okay. Um, so um, that th those systems are um, truly, truly legacy systems, very old. Um, we um, have started down the path of a, a modernization uh, roadmap. Um, the health exchange is actually a part of that. So yeah, we, we are involved in, um, in those projects as well. 
Representative Khan. Well, Madam Chairman, I guess what I'm interested, and I have no idea that this is happening and so forth, but what if there are, recal are there a possibility of recalcitrant counties? Are counties more interested in being in coordination with the state, some more interested than others? You know, this is a problem of our 87 counties or whatever the number is and what, um, you know, what, what, is it something that can be done to encourage people to move in that direction if they're not? Commissioner? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Khan, um, I haven't gone out looking for those opportunities. Okay. Um, I certainly have heard from some counties I've, I've attended and spoken to some county IT um, gatherings. And um, it, it, it strikes me that there is um, some potential there for, um, you know, pulling together um, as counties and coming up with uh, solutions. Um, we also regularly have people that meet with counties um, just to sort of hear what their IT needs are and how we might be able to, and to help them out. And our technical advisory uh, council has a representative from the AMC um, on it. That's Gary Shelton from Scott County. So he does represent uh, county issues um, in, in light of IT in the state as well. We, have, we just have not um, gotten involved beyond um, the services that um, are sort of core services that we could provide and have provided to counties. Representative Newton. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and uh, Representative Kahn, I'm on the Health and Human Services Committee, and, and they discussed this yesterday. Um, the, the, the Health and Human Services has got a system for, for, I think it's DOS system that's some 30 years old that, uh, you know, is not compatible with especially what's going on in Hennepin County, which has just spent a lot of money upgrading its own system. Uh, they, they can't talk with one another. And so the story yesterday was that one of the people working in health services for the county needs three computers in order to work with uh, the, the state's uh, HHS system. So this is something that they're trying to upgrade that they're looking at as part of the, the new budget year. Uh, but whether they're going to be compatible or not, especially in the bigger counties, is somewhat of a question, I think. Well, uh, Madam Chairman. Representative Khan. You know, the problem I have is that we know that everybody's got old grandfathered in systems and that sort of thing. I mean, but what can we do to facilitate counties working together to get one system that works with the state system? Is there Mr. Eichten. <laughs> You've been so quiet. Madam Chair and members. That question. Madam Chair and, and members, my name, for the record, is John Eichton. I, I'm legislative director for Minute Services. Um, you know, I have heard discussions from the counties about perhaps coming to the legislature to, to make a request for some funding, especially around a security program for the counties. Um, I haven't heard much of that discussion in the last month or so, but I'm sure any any support that the legislature could provide to counties to approach their technology in a more comprehensive and cooperative way would be welcome by those counties. Uh, the systems are currently developed, from my understanding, mostly independently within each of the 87 counties, but um, I'm sure any state support would be, would be welcome. Well, I'm, I was thinking, Madam Chairman. Good discussion. Right. I, I, I was through man. <laughs> no, I was thinking of something that was a little bit more than just support. <laughs> Not even encouragement. <laughs> we like dialogue. <laughs> I bet we're going to face it. <laughs> Representative Newton. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, Commissioner, I, I'd like to ask if in, this is following on Representative Kahn's uh, statement. If HHS has approached you in terms of updating their system so that it, it would be a state updated system and not one agency updating their system. It has to be. Commissioner Parnell. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Newton, uh, absolutely that's what IT consolidation is all about. Um, actually, one of our best people, Tom Baden, is the CIO for DHS. He reports directly to me. Um, he is involved in, uh, in all of the DHS systems. 
And I would also like to add that, you know, we can now leverage some of these DHS systems and the investments in things like HICS with other applications in the state. So, for example, um, we were able to leverage um, our uh, investment in the health exchange to benefit SWIFT and had a cost avoidance of $800,000 to $1 million um, by the, avail the, the availability of, um, of consolidated efforts. And, um, you know, it's not an, uh, an isolated approach anymore. We in uh, Minute are able to look across the entire executive branch and weigh things and balance things and leverage uh, one investment with another investment. Um, it, it was really, in my opinion, the right thing to do. Commissioner is the person that you just mentioned, um, one of the 2,055 employees? Uh, Madam Chair, yes, Tom Baden is uh, okay. a minute Pond. employee. Uh, uh, are we going to get to help make the legislative change to minute? Or is it, where is that being done from OET, which I have never really liked? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Madam Chair, I believe what Representative Khan is asking is whether or not we are going to request that there be a formal change um, of name from the Office of Enterprise Technology to um, uh, Minnesota IT. I don't believe we are presenting that, but we would be in full support of uh, anyone who did. I think the Chair will take care of that for you. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Shepard, well, okay. Of that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have maybe some suggested language, Mr. Shepard. Um, <laughs> on that point, Commissioner Parnell, in the budget book, we've got the governmental change for e government and innovation part partnership. Do you have draft language prepared? Yes, we do. And has it been introduced, or is it going to be introduced? Um, I don't believe it's in, been introduced yet. Um, it is still um, going through its uh, final paces, but um, we have it drafted and um, we'll be ready soon. Are there any other bills that you are reviewing for introduction? Uh, Madam Chair, I believe we um, are introducing some cleanup language. Um, that's a result of IT consolidation, nothing terribly substantive. Um, and there are some um, uh, MinGeo um, changes that we are also introducing. They do not have a financial implication at this point, um, so they will be going through the policy committees. Representative Simon. Oh, uh, Madam Chair, I was just going to say a few minutes ago on the subject of name changes. I know Representative Khan has been involved in that before. We have former Commissioner Tom Hansen there, and I know that the last time we did a major name change, I think <laughs> Mr. Hansen was Commissioner of, I think he started out as Commissioner of Finance, and then by the time he left, he came to MMB. So this committee has done that before uh, in recent history, a major agency name change. And people appear in different forms. Different responsibilities Madam all Chair. the time around here. Madam Chair, may I ask if Representative that, Newton. Is that an executive order of the chair that can change a name like that? I don't think so. I don't I haven't been told there's any executive orders for this chair. <laughs> We're collaborative here. We have dialogue. <laughs> Cooperation. And and photographs and sage. Mm. <laughs> I did want to, I did want to uh, mention that on the minute employee symbol or minute whatever that symbol is, it looks like the Pillsbury Joy Dope <laughs> Boy is in a wellness program, <laughs> and uh, is your new mascot. He's the, Madam Chair, he's the. The Pillsbury gluten-free doughboy. <laughs> All right. Well, I congratulate him. You make him look so good. Or her. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Madam Chair, committee members. Appreciate it. Is there any 
one in the audience that came or is inspired to speak on behalf of or say something about what was said by the Department of the Historical Society or uh, Minute, Minute Minnesota, Minnesota IT. Anyone that wants to say anything about the Attorney General program? PFA. 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 Uh, the PFA program. If not, oh, someone is. We do have someone that wants to come down. <clears throat> and I'm Mr. sorry, Garcia. Madam Chair. My name is Michael Garcia. I'm president and CEO of the Duluth Children's Museum. And since I drove down on such a snowy day, <laughs> To observe part of the proceedings today, the issue that I wanted to speak to was the Historical Society presentation. I just didn't catch your attention at that moment. We'll um, take, take this time now. Thank you. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, um, what I wanted to share with you is just an anecdotal story about the impact that the Historical Society can have on a relatively small organization. The Duluth Children's Museum is, in fact, the fifth oldest children's museum in the country, established in 1930. And the reason that that's relevant is that that children's museum, unlike most in the country, is one of five that is a collection-based museum. That is unusual in that we have items in our treasure, like a Civil War journal um, that was given to us by a Duluth family from an enlisted man. And we have the full transcription of that that was done. Um, we also have an enormous doll collection, over 1,600 dolls. And the Duluth Children's Museum, um, over its 82 years of history, has primarily treated their responsibility as curatorial, storing the collection out of the public eye. Um, we recently applied to the Minnesota Historical Society for a very small grant, um, $7,000, 1% of our budget. But in order to do that, we had to back up first. And as an organization, we had to go to our federal agency, the Institute of Museum and Library Services. We had to go through a comprehensive analysis of our collection, bring in an external expert that was paid for by the federal government. And we were able to do that and, and leverage those federal dollars because we had a state agency that we could apply to for collection assistance. So the, the um, multiplier effect of that $7,000 has been significant. Since we started the work on the doll collection, the awareness of the Duluth Children's Museum collection has come into public light, and we have now gone from our 1,600 objects in that category of our collection to over 1,900 objects because of the death of a Duluthian who had over 300 historic dolls of museum quality that were collected around the world. And her husband came to us and said, my wife's wish was to have these in the public. And so I am asking you if you would take them and curate them and make them available to the public. All of this has led to the relocation of the Duluth Children's Museum collection. And it has garnered um, an offset to our budget of $48,000 for our space allocation for our collection into a donated service that comes from a local family that owns a bank in town and that had an unoccupied building that they didn't want to bring up to code for occupancy, but that would work for our collection storage. The result of that is that we're able to keep our museum open longer hours to the public, serve more children, and make our collection more available. I share this story with you because I think that the history of their grant making, the efficiency of their ability to partner across the state of Minnesota with small organizations such as the one that I administer is an outstanding example of, of a good investment of state dollars and taxpayer dollars, and one without the benefit of which the Duluth Children's Museum would be much smaller today. 
So I just wanted to congratulate them, thank them, and just share with you a story from my own community about the importance of those dollars. Thank you, Madam Chair. And it's a good thing you're in your new space. Absolutely, Madam Chair. Hopefully we will move across the parking lot into the bigger space in the next three years, but we have expanded our space considerably. Thank you. Thank you. Your remarks were very welcome. Thank you. Members, the next meeting will be Monday. Representative Freiberg. Need the minutes moved? No. Oh, okay. This meeting is adjourned. Mm -hmm.